Welcome to part two of Alfred the Great and the Last Kingdom. It might be worth listening to part one to get the full story, but if you're just that eager to hear about some Vikings getting knocked about, then I don't begrudge you for that. In part one, we covered Alfred's childhood, his family, his love of learning, his love of the church, the Battle of Ashdown, the death of his father and brother, his internal crisis on ascending to the throne, the Siege of Wareham, and the miracle in the English Channel. At the end of the episode, Guthrum and his men had ambushed Alfred in the midst of the Twelfth Night Festival. Alfred and his family and a few guards had only just managed to escape and lose Guthrum in the swamps of Somerset in Western England. So, at the lowest point of his life, comes the most well-known story of King Alfred. As Alfred and his men snuck through the swamps, evading Guthrum's men searching for them, they came across the hut of a swineherd named Danewolf. In his bedraggled state, Alfred looked nothing like a king, and posing as a humble traveller, he asked Danewolf if he and his entourage could stay with his family for a few days. Danewolf agreed, providing the group helped out with chores around the farm, which Alfred agreed to. A few days later, Dane Wolf's wife was baking loaves of bread in the oven. She suddenly had to attend to the pigs outside, so she asked Alfred to keep an eye on the loaves and make sure they didn't burn. But Alfred, so lost in his own thoughts about his kingdom, he completely spaced out, and by the time she came back inside, the loaves had burnt through. Annoyed, she turned to the king, her king, and scolded him. You hesitate to turn the loaves which you see burning, yet you're quite happy to eat them once they come from the oven. Alfred was taken aback. He had never been spoken to in such a way by a woman of such low standing, but he accepted the criticism and offered to help her with the next batch. But once it became clear he had no idea what he was doing, he was hurriedly shooed out of the kitchen. The amusing story has been told and retold countless times with countless variations. In some, Alfred forgets the bread because he's sharpening arrows for the upcoming war, and in others he makes Dane Wolf one of his bishops later on. Even though this story was first told by a monk a hundred years after Alfred's death, it has become an enduring symbol of the determination and humility of Alfred's character. In no retelling of the story does Alfred lord himself over the peasant woman. There is no, do you know who I am? Instead, despite an obvious mistake, he stays the course. It's fair to say that throughout his life, Alfred burnt his fair share of cakes, but was never shy on working on a new loaf. I've put a picture of an artist's uh, rendition of this scene on our Instagram page. After leaving Dan Wolf's farm, Alfred and his retinue set themselves up on the small marshy island of Athelney. With his usual resoluteness, he wastes no time and gets to work on a temporary base, sending scouts out into the countryside to find out what the state of affairs was. The reports came back in that one of his eldermen had betrayed him and now served Guthrum, but others had not decided either way. This was all he needed. It meant there was still time. With whatever fighting forces he had left, he raided Guthrum's supplies and ambushed his patrols. Wulfhair, the elderman of Wiltshire who had betrayed him, received the same treatment. His message was clear. Wessex still had a king and he expected you to keep your oath. Guthrum knew that while Alfred still lived, his hold on the kingdom was shaky, but his scouting parties that entered the marshes came back with less men than they left with, or not at all. Old Saxon legends say that Alfred worked to continue to feed his people during this troubled time, and one particularly tall tale has him multiplying loaves of bread in the same way Jesus did. Other bizarre tales tell us of him dressing up as a minstrel and wandering through the Danish camps. As he delighted crowds with the lute he somehow learnt to play, he listened carefully to all the rumours, gossip and plans of his enemies. Disregarding these stories, Alfred really did seem to do whatever he could to maintain the loyalty of his elder men during this difficult time. One of the men who had rejected Guthrum's alliance was Oda, elderman of Devon. Hailing from the coast, Oda had experienced the devastation that the Danes had brought with them, and when Guthrum's offer came to him, it was immediately rejected. In retaliation, Guthrum sent Uber, one of Ragnar's little pigs, to deal with him. Uber and his men marched south with their usual breakneck speed, much too quickly for a feared army to be summoned by Oda. Knowing the militia he had slapped together would be no match for the Danish warriors, Oda and his men barricaded themselves in a hill fort near Somerset. 
The Danes surrounded the fort and banked on the surrender of Oda and his militia once their supplies ran low. Uber and his men were confident in victory, and they had every right to be. Apart from the hardened warriors, they had a secret weapon, a magical banner that could predict the outcome of battles. The banner was believed to be sewn by Uber's sister under orders of their father, Ragnar Lodbrok. The banner featured a white raven against a black background, and with the correct wind, it looked like the raven was flying. This was said to signal a victory, and this is what Uber and his men saw. With Odin on their side, the Danes relaxed and waited for their foretold victory. But while they relaxed, the hill fort was abuzz with activity. The Saxon men knew their only chance was a surprise attack. They had to catch the Danes off guard. So the very next day, as the sun began to rise in the sleepy Danish camp, Odin and his militia burst out of the fort and barreled downhill into the Danish camp. The sheer audacity of the attack completely blindsided Uber and his men, who had barely put together any defensive perimeter whatsoever. They blitzed through the front lines, armed with garden hoes, hand axes and old swords. They butchered the Danes before they even had a chance to fight back. Uber himself was killed in the carnage, and Oda took the faulty magical banner as a prize. Whatever men were remaining made haste back north. As Alfred built up his makeshift capital in Athelney, it's stories like this that sustained him, knowing that the men of Wessex had not laid down to Danish rule. So he sent out his scouts again, this time with a message. On the 5th of May, 878, his eldermen would call their levies and assemble before their king at the plains of Eckbert Stone, and there they would together reclaim their lands. With Alfred in exile, Guthrum had given his men free reign to plunder Wessex, eager to punish the countryside for protecting their king. Crops had been burned, family members murdered and kidnapped, and churches ransacked. In a way, they had played right into Alfred's hand, swaying any fence-sitting locals who may or may not have decided on capitulating. Down on the coast, the older men of Devon and Dorset were still loyal to Alfred, but their men were needed on the coast in case of another surprise landing. Wulfher, the elder men of Wiltshire, had betrayed him to Guthrum, but Alfred was hopeful that perhaps some of his bannermen would still answer the call of their rightful king. But truthfully, it was the men of Somerset and Hampshire who he was relying on. Finally taking a page from the Danish handbook, Alfred commanded his men to gather on the Christian festival of Whit Sunday. This was unorthodox, and he was banking on the Danes not expecting it. So, on the field of Eckbert Stone, just south of Wiltshire County, Alfred met his men for the first time in months. Much of the population had heard about his resistance, but few would have seen him in person. By the time the day was through, 4,000 vengeful Saxons had rallied to fight for Wessex, including many men of Wiltshire who had turned their back on Elderman Wulfhair. Alfred had his army, and now he had to use it. Timing was everything. The assembly was still a secret, but a gathering this size would not stay so for long. Alfred and his eldermen quickly agreed that they would move north and besiege Chippenham, Guthrum's capital, but by the time they broke camp the next day, word had already reached the Danes. Guthrum hurriedly summoned all the men he could and marched out of the city. A decisive victory on the battlefield was now the only option. Guthrum, with reinforcements, headed for a hill fort south of Bath, and Alfred and his men camped nearby. A sombre and pensive mood blanketed the Saxon camp that night. Time was spent praying, sharpening weapons, and burying gold and other trinkets. At 5am they broke camp and marched to Guthrum's hill fort, finding him and his men already dug in and waiting. From the imposing Danish shield wall came the jeers of Guthrum's men, beating their shields and calling out, taunting the Saxons to go and take their last shot. The taunts made it clear what would happen to the men's wives and children and land after they'd finished with them. Stoic and unmoved, Alfred rode up and down his lines. While his own shield wall formed, he praised his men for their bravery and their commitment to the realm. Looking individual men in the eye, he spoke of the dishonour of running from the shield wall, and the debt that each man owed to the man standing next to him. And then, he interlocked himself amongst them, and started the march forward. As both armies closed the distance, the armies threw their spears. The throwing spear they used was a variation of the old Roman Pella and was barbed at the end as to render his shield useless once it was lodged in. If any man's shield was hit in this way, he quickly moved to the back of the line and the next man stepped forward to take his place. It's possible Guthrum had a few berserkers at the front of his line, 
Berserkers were half-crazed warriors who wore almost no armor and fought in a drug-induced frenzy, ignoring pain, cold, and heat as they fought on until they were literally cut apart. More of a psychological weapon than a physical one, Guthrum would have deployed these men to weigh on the psyche of the Wessex army. After the berserkers had been cut to ribbons, the battle commenced. The two shield walls crashed into each other, where they remained for the majority of the day. As Guthrum and Alfred worked to keep the resolve of their men up, the ranks of the fallen in the front row slowly grew. The groans of the dying and the wounded carried across the battlefield as men strained against the weight of the other. Those in the front lines had nowhere to go, being held in place by their own army behind them and the enemy in front. All they could do was keep their shield up and look for opportunities to stab and slash. But by the mid-afternoon, the Danes' resolve had started to give out. While Alfred and his men fought for their land and for their religion, the Danes fought for plunder. As it became clear that the Danes' strength was wavering, Alfred, drenched in sweat, dirt and blood, cheered his men forward. Asa tells us, quote, he defeated with great slaughter and pursued them flying to their stronghold. Immediately, he slew all the men and carried off all the horses and cattle he could find. As the men of Wessex surged forward in the final push of victory, whatever Danes were still holding the lines broke and ran. As the sun set on the day, Guthrum, broken and dirty, limped back into Chippenham. Alfred and his men arrived shortly after and blockaded the city. Guthrum played for time, but after 14 days with no food or reinforcements, he was forced to unconditionally surrender to King Alfred. Alfred's conditions were lenient, considering the bargaining position. Guthrum was to leave Wessex and never return. He was to provide hostages to Alfred, who would provide none back. But uniquely, he was also baptised into the Christian faith by Alfred himself. Alfred's belief was a cornerstone of his character, and it's likely that this gesture was to show thanks to God, and, with any luck, the baptism would imbue Guthrum with some good Christian values. And so a few weeks later, a very apprehensive Guthrum met Alfred near the village of Wedmore. Thirty battle-hardened Danes watched in amazement as Alfred tenderly took the head of his worst enemy and plunged him into the icy lake. Guthrum the pagan was submerged below the water but it was Athelstan the Christian that emerged from it. Alfred and his new godson Athelstan spent the next two weeks feasting, celebrating and gift-giving. This must have been surreal to both parties. These were the men from the other side of the shield wall who they had been told were wild beasts, lowly Christians or godless heathens and they now sat alongside them, feasting and drinking. We've got an artist's impression of the baptism on our Instagram page at Anthology of Heroes, or one word. I know what you're thinking. A sneaky old Guthrum up to his old tricks again. This baptism would last about as long as he leaves Alfred's court. Well, you'd be... wrong. Although there were occasional raids into Wessex from Guthrum's domain, this peace treaty really did mark the end of hostility between these two men. The baptism seems to have stuck as well. Not too long after... Guthrum began to print coins with his new Christian name, Athelstan, on them. Even more incredibly, when a fresh batch of Guthrum's kin arrived from Denmark, he refused their request to join forces in another war against Wessex. And ultimately, the invasion was called off. It seemed that finally Alfred's faith in the Lord was validated. Guthrum had finally given up the idea of ruling Wessex, and seemed to realise that an alliance and a shared faith with its ruling family would be more advantageous in the long run. The year 878 had been the most turbulent and difficult year of Alfred's life. His fall from grace and his revival almost seemed like a biblical story itself, but there was more work to be done. At the moment, Wessex could stand proudly, but for how long? Almost all of England still remained in Danish hands, and the very weaknesses that had pushed Alfred to the very edge of complete defeat were still glaringly obvious. First was the outdated Fjord army model, which time and time again had been exploited by the Danes, who had come and gone by the time the Fjord was summoned. Alfred set to work reforming this from the ground up. The idea likely came to him on a trip to Rome when he met the French king Charles the Bald. Charles had constructed a series of fortifiable strongholds that the vulnerable could fall back to in the event of a raid. 
Alfred copied this idea in what would become known as the Burgle system. Apart from the construction of strongholds, Alfred also standardised how many men were required for the defence of each, and how much food the local lords would need to have stockpiled. The idea was expensive to implement and unpopular with the local lords, who had to shell out extra funds for it to work. But if it did, it meant that the Danes would be outside in the cold, trying to take a walled city, while Alfred had time to summon his army and deal with the invasion. In case you're listening from England, this is the origin of the word borough, which is used for neighbourhoods today. As Alfred wrestled with his barons over the needs of his kingdom, he was continuously bedridden for weeks at a time. Whatever sickness that had afflicted him in his earlier days still plagued him now. Even so, he was determined to ensure his children were educated from a young age and spared no expense finding the best tutors in England or abroad. Asa tells us that he personally read to his children. The same fondness he had for Anglo-Saxon poetry seems to have persisted into adulthood. Across the relative security of Wessex, the arts began to flourish. Underpinning these reforms was Alfred's obsession with piety and godliness. The spot where he had won his victory at Eddington had an impressive chapel built atop of it. Henry VIII demolished this chapel, but there's still a small monument standing on the spot. I'll be adding it to our Instagram page if you're ever in Bath and want to check it out. Whatever free time Alfred had, he pored over the Saxon translations of the old Latin works, but was limited by whatever passages that the monks had previously transcribed. Sparing no expense, he ramped up the efforts and recruited any literate monk he could find to get to work. And when this was still not enough, he took the unprecedented step of learning Latin in his late 30s. This, coming from a man who learnt to read English at age 12, is an incredible achievement, and speaks volumes about his dedication to the church, literally. Incredibly, we still have some of his very translations to this day. In a preface written by the king himself, he writes on his reasons for performing the translations this, quote, I remembered also that I saw, before it had all been ravaged and burned, how the churches throughout the whole of England filled with treasures and books, and there was also a great multitude of God's servants, but they had very little knowledge of the books, for they could not understand anything of them, because they were not written in their own language. He then goes on to lament how literacy had fallen since the time of his ancestors. Quote, Our forefathers, who formerly held these places, loved wisdom, and through it they obtained wealth and bequeathed it to us. In this we can still see their tracks, but we cannot follow them. As Wessex began to revive itself, many minor rulers in Wales submitted themselves to Alfred's rule, and he became the vassal lord for a good portion of Wales. Alfred continued his efforts on centralisation, creating a code of laws that provided guidance on legal issues. Some of these laws were downright odd, such as, if a man intentionally kills another man by letting a tree fall on him, then this tree shall be given to the kinsman of the slain. But the idea behind the code was sound, and it was meant to consolidate many different decentralised law codexes that had been written in the past. But what was the point of all these laws if his elderman could not read them? In his most radical decision yet, Alfred declared that all his eldermen needed to have a basic comprehension of the English language, or step down from their post. Out of all his reforms, this was met with the most pushback, and had the potential to isolate Alfred from the men most loyal to him, men who had stood by his side at Eddington when others had deserted him. Eventually, Alfred made some concessions. If his elderman could pay for the service of a clerk to read in their stead, this was an acceptable compromise. Perhaps as a reward for those who stepped up, Alfred created one of the most beautiful examples of Anglo-Saxon craftsmanship that we still have today. In 1693, a farmer ploughing his fields discovered a golden trinket about the size of his palm. It was teardrop shaped and showed a figure made from coloured quartz, framed in gold with lettering around the border. The translation of the lettering read, Alfred ordered me made. Incredibly, the farmer had found the best and only surviving example of Alfred's cultural revival. The exact purpose of the jewel is debated. With its long needle-like point, some believe it was given as gifts to his eldermen to help them focus on the line they were trying to read. Others believe it may have been the head of a staff, and others believe it was intended to be placed in a crown. We've got a picture of this totally unique item 
now known as the Alfred Jewel, on our Instagram. Or even better, once lockdown ends, go see it yourself at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. As Alfred approached his mid-40s, he continued to steer Wessex through its golden age. As his children grew up, their education began to pay off. His daughter, Aethelflaed, married into the Mercian nobility and implemented Alfred's ingenious burgal system to help protect their lands. Alfred's sickness took more and more time of him as he aged. Asa says that by 45 years old, not a single hour went by when Alfred was not in pain. But even when bedridden, he worked hard to translate as many Latin texts as he could get his hands on. Alfred knew it would soon be time to meet his maker, but it seemed there was one final trial left for the weary king. With Wessex now armed to the teeth, the new hotspot for the Vikings was over the Channel in France. Paris had been subjected to the same plunder that England had previously, and the Danish war chief, uh, Halfstein, had well and truly had his fill. Usually this would have been of no great concern to Alfred. In East Anglia, Guthrum, aka Athelstan, had proven loyal, but two years back he had passed away, and his successor, Eorik, had avoided swearing the same oath that Guthrum had. With Guthrum out of the way, Hastin and another commander decided East Anglia was a prime recruiting ground. The two armies made up around 320 ships, a humongous fleet, but very likely half filled with booty and slaves from France. Due to the sheer size, they needed to arrive at different ports, and as they arrived, Alfred's new standing army blocked the route between the two hosts, preventing them from linking up. Alfred tried the same tactic he had with Guthrum, but all the jewels and praise took him back when Hastine casually told him that he'd already been baptised, several times in fact. The negotiations ended inconclusively, and the Viking raids continued across southern England. However, Wessex held its ground. The Burgles, in which his eldermen had objected so vocally to, proved their worth time and time again, keeping the civilians of Wessex safe while they waited on the standing army to arrive. With his legacy firmly in place, Alfred of Wessex slipped away one night, likely due to complications from his illness. He was only 50 years old, and he had left his realm in a much, much better place than he had found it 13 years earlier. Though the Viking threat was still there, it had been blunted. Alfred's son Edward would not only keep Wessex strong, but with the help of his sister in Mercia, forced the Vikings out of Mercia and East Anglia, their only remaining holdout being Northumbria. Alfred's body was interred in the cathedral in Winchester, where his wife and son were eventually laid to rest also. Sadly, due to Norman invasions and Henry VIII cracked down on Catholicism, their bodies were moved again and again, until in 1788 when the small abbey they were buried in was used as a stone quarry. A few convicts found the tomb of Alfred and sold the ornate stones that entombed him, smashed apart his bones and scattered them around the areas. It's truly lamentable to think of a few men smashing apart the bones of a man who had such a profound impact on their life and the very language they were speaking at the time. In a 2002 poll by the BBC, King Alfred ranked number 14 in the top 100 greatest Britons of all time. No king appeared ahead of him. For a country with history as rich as England, it says a lot about what he left behind. But Alfred's legacy is not so straightforward. What historians dub the cult of Alfred did not crop up overnight. Though always a cult hero in Western England, Alfred being a symbol of English liberty is relatively new. The title he was known, The Great, was only coined in the 16th century. Interestingly, his legacy is blended into that of the mythical English figure King Arthur. I'm not sure if it's the name or the shared godliness, but I even met an English guy at a hotel a few years back who was insistent King Arthur and Alfred were the same person. Alfred never was or even tried to pretend he was King of England. The title did not even exist yet, but his campaign certainly paved the way for the development of English identity. In fact, it was only two generations later that his grandson, Athelstan, that's no relation to Guthrum, would claim the title King of England for the first time. The British Navy that, at its peak, controlled a good portion of the known world, has also been attributed to starting with Alfred. Along with his burgle reforms, he tried his hand at crafting a fleet, intending to stop the Danes before they even reached his shores. For me personally, 
Alfred of Wessex, represents determination and grit. He was a mortal man. He made mistakes, many of them, but he always stayed the course and made the most of the hand he was dealt. Not too long ago, I took a trip out to the West Country, and after a few dead ends found King Alfred's Tower, an impressive 18th century tower in the middle of the woods built on the site of Eckbert's Stone, where Alfred rallied his men after his exile. It was a surreal feeling to stand on the very spot where the history of a nation as pivotal as England was decided by the determination of one man. The plaque there reads, Alfred the Great, AD 879, on this summit erected his standard against the Danish invaders. To him we owe the origin of juries, the establishment of the militia, the creation of a naval force. Alfred, the light of a benighted age, was a philosopher and a Christian, the father of his people, the founder of the English, monarchy and liberty. In a story that sounds too ridiculous to be true, the tower was damaged in 1944 when a single-engine plane flew into it, knocking off the hand of the statue of Alfred at the top. The plane's name? The Nordian Norseman. Those Danes really do hold a grudge, don't they? I really hope you enjoyed my first Anthology of Heroes two-parter episode. I tried my best to keep this as a single podcast, but I love Alfred's story, and didn't think it would be doing him justice to compress it so much information into a single episode. If you've enjoyed this one, it would be great if you could rate this podcast on Apple or follow us on Instagram, at Anthology of Heroes, or one word. We've got a load of interesting pictures coming for this episode, not just artist's impression, but also scenes, coins, maps pictures I took myself, all the good stuff. I'm also very interested in what country you'd like to hear next. I've ditched the A to Z routine, and while I've got a plan in my head, if there's a story that you think is worth sharing, I'd love to hear it. So please reach out. Take care, and see you on the next episode. A big thank you to the show's Patreons, Luke, Malcolm, Tom, and Claudia. A lot of people don't realize it, but this is a one-man show, so there's quite a bit of time that goes into producing it. I love sharing these stories, and it means a ton knowing that there's a people out there who are really enjoying them. You guys help me keep the costs down for things like web hosting, sound libraries, books, and stuff like that. If you're not a patron already, we've got some cool rewards up, like having the option to read out some quotes I use in the show. If you want to have a look, tap the link in our bio.